Joining us now is Austin Congressman-elect Greg Kassar. Congressman, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So you just got back from the first part of freshman orientation in Congress. Just walk us a little bit through how that process works as you're entering the House. Well, nobody from Austin has done that process in decades. It's a brand new seat here in Central Texas that I've been honored to be elected to. And orientation started out like so many other jobs. You get your parking pass and are given your laptop. Uh, but then also, being a new member of Congress, there were some incredibly powerful moments. I was on the House floor as Speaker Pelosi, who's led the Democratic Party now for decades, uh, gave her speech passing the torch along to new leadership. I was joined there with dozens of newly progressive elected members of Congress who are ready to now start setting a new course for the party that really tackles the big issues like what's happening with the Supreme Court, restoring people's civil rights and abortion rights, raising wages uh, for working class people, uh, and really taking on the issues of the day. So it's been so great to have her leadership, but now she's passing the torch along, and it was incredible to be there for that moment during orientation. Yeah, speaking of Speaker Pelosi stepping down from decades long in leadership, it's looking like Representative Hakeem Jeffries, a Democrat from New York, is going to uh, be her successor. Do you plan to support Jeffries as a potential leader of the Democratic Party? I will, he's the one candidate uh, running for that position. Well, we have also Congressman Aguilar, Congresswoman um, Catherine Clark, also the only candidates in those top three spots. And I just had a conversation um, with Congressman Jeffries yesterday where we talked about Texas. We talked about the fact that abortion rights have been stripped away here. It's not just a threat like in other parts of the country. They've actually been stripped away here. We talked about the fact that we have less people insured with health insurance in Texas than anywhere else in the country because our governor continues to reject Medicaid dollars. Dollars that we pay in our income taxes are getting sent away and aren't being brought back in Texas because of an old fight with Obama. But we should really be fighting to protect people's lives. So I had that conversation with him and really urged that we look at what's happening in Texas as a crisis and that we need his support and the Congress to be focusing on those issues. Mm, that's interesting. You know, from that conversation, what did you two talk about as possible steps forward in addressing some of those issues, uh, specifically with abortion? Because as, as you know, Democrats, even when they had the House, were unable to codify Roe versus Wade. So even now with Republicans in their slim majority, what are the steps forward for that? Yeah, two things. First, uh, with Republicans in the majority, we need to be able to fight off further attacks on basic civil rights. We've already heard from uh, Kevin McCarthy, who seeks to be the Speaker of the House, that he wants to attack basic things like Social Security and Medicare. So we have to put up a strong front line to block any cuts to basic programs like Social Security. Then second, we need to be able to work on any bipartisan uh, bill that actually is for the good of everyday people here in Central Texas, like protecting our dreamers. So there's some of that work. But then third, to your real question here about how do we restore abortion rights, that means taking back the House and getting to 52 in the Senate, because it looks like that's what it's going to take to restore abortion rights. And we were really close. All of the pundits said that there was going to be this red wave, that we were going to get wiped out. And in fact, voters actually overwhelmingly stood with Democrats. If it weren't for some of the things that happened with gerrymandering in places like Texas or New York, Democrats would actually still control the House. We had a great election for Democrats, and now we need to fight for the next election to get enough of a majority, not just in the House, but in the Senate, to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. It's one of the bills I will put my name on in the first week in the Congress. Women's Health Protection Act would essentially make Roe v. Wade the law and make it so that places like the Supreme Court could no longer take that away. We've got two years until then, so that's a long time for you know those women who do want that as a possibility, is a choice and option for them. So what can Democrats do now without having power in the House? Over the course of the next few months, I'm gonna to continue to work uh, alongside other members of Congress to work with the Biden administration to allow more abortion medication to be sent into the state of Texas. This is FDA approved medication that the state of Texas should not be allowed to block. And the United States mail, federal mail service is not regulated, it is not run by the state of Texas. And so I believe uh, that we can continue to advocate for executive orders from the Democratic president, from President Biden, to make that more accessible to people. We know that there's so many Texans driving to New Mexico or driving to Kansas, and that's just wrong. Why should people have to leave their home state for this basic health care? 
And so we're, we can work as Democrats to work with the president to provide people the care they need because we know people are suffering right now. Do you think the president, he resisted calls for this in the beginning right after Roe versus Wade was overturned, but do you think that there should be federal clinics operating here? Because as we've seen, virtually all clinics in Texas are either not operating or under very certain small circumstances. Yeah, I think looking at federal land and federal doctors would be a key way of achieving this, and I'm gonna to continue to have those conversations with the White House. The reason I bring up abortion medication is because that one seems like a very clear way. As a matter of fact, a majority of people that need abortion care are using medication uh, themselves already at home. And so if we could make it that that was easily mailed to you, then I think that'd be a good first step. And then we should absolutely be looking at uh, ideas like using federal land or our VA hospitals or other places, but most people uh, aren't needing uh, a procedural abortion. A lot of folks can do it just with medication, and so we need to really work on that because that could help lots of people so that you don't have to drive across the state or across state lines. So aside from abortion, how do you plan to push forward on some of your priorities with a Republican-controlled House, albeit slim majority? Yeah, we absolutely can start making sure that we build uh, and have lots of people sign on to bills that would be ready to pass as soon as we got back to a Democratic majority. I hope and wish that folks from the other side of the aisle would come and sign on to some of these bills, and I will work with them if they're willing to. The fact of the matter is, the vast majority of Texans believe that we need to raise the minimum wage from $7.25 to at least $15 an hour. The vast majority of Texans believe we should accept these Medicaid dollars so that people can have access to health insurance. The vast majority of Texas believe we shouldn't be locking people up for small amounts of marijuana. Instead, we should be investing in our schools. If Republicans want to sign on to those bills, I'd be ready to do so, even be ready to compromise on those issues. But also what we should do is have the Democrats line those bills up with strong majority support so that if the American people deliver us the House majority again in two years, that those be ready to pass first thing. Okay, and you know, speaking to that, you've talked about progressive policies being popular. You know, you just listed a couple things that you think the majority of Texans support. But as far as our statewide races went, it was still, you know, Republicans won across the board, showing that they still have dominance in this state. So, what kind of ongoing conversations are you having amongst fellow Democrats, like uh, former Congressman Beto O'Rourke, about the path forward, at least here in Texas? Yeah, to win statewide elections we have to be able to speak to the majority of people who don't vote in the first place. The fact of the matter is, Texas is not inherently a Democratic or Republican state. We're a state where most people that are registered to vote don't vote in these governor's races. I don't blame folks. If a system has failed you time and time again, people ask, well, why participate in the first place? And why it's so important to participate is because we continue to see a transfer of wealth from middle-class families and working-class families to these big multinational corporations. What we saw under the Trump administration were these enormous tax cuts for the richest corporations on earth that ultimately hurt everyday people. What we saw under Governor Abbott and how he responded to the winter storm was people suffering and dying and then also our utility bills going up while some of these big corporations made money on that storm. And so what we need to do is talk about those economic issues as Democrats where we're good on civil rights issues. I think a lot of folks know that but I think that in the past the Democratic Party of LBJ, for example, who lived here in Austin, was one where most people knew that Democrats were out there looking out for the working person. And that's, I think, where we need to get to, where we're protecting Social Security, but also working to expand your wages and aren't just there uh, to protect these big corporations. I think that's the difference, and that's going to be a long-term struggle. That's not something that's resolved in one election. I think that's going to take a long-term commitment on our part in Texas. That was a keynote of your campaign. I mean, granted, your district it leans Democratic to begin with, but do you think, you know, talking about protecting the rights of working-class Texans and everyday Texans, is that something that helped you at least beat your, comp your Democratic competitors? Yes, I think that's so important. You know, there were independent voters and even more conservative voters who said, I may disagree on uh, abortion rights issues, they might disagree on some immigration issues, but at the end of the day, if we're standing with unions, if we're wanting to make sure that you can pay your mortgage uh, or pay your rent, that folks recognize that. I worked really hard on an eviction moratorium so that people weren't evicted during the pandemic, worked on a foreclosure moratorium so the big banks weren't taking people's houses during the pandemic in the city. And I think it's that kind talking, taking care of people's economic issues that's going to win over some of those independent voters, but also bring people into the fold that never wanted to vote before. 
what the president did on student debt cancellation was so important for those young folks, a lot of whom don't vote, but who said, well, look, I may not have cared about politics before, but indeed these politicians and these big banks do seem to care about me. And the question is, do you want politicians that are aligned with those big banks or do you want politicians that are gonna be aligned with the need of the person who's just trying to pay the bills? So you're obviously a freshman in Congress. Who so far are you trying to make alliances with and who do you see as potential allies as you work to get some of your priorities across the finish line? Well, I'm really thrilled that uh, just coming back from orientation, got, just got off the plane last night, is that we have more Latino members of Congress incoming in this Democratic class than at any time in history. We're gonna have the largest progressive caucus in the history of the United States Congress. And so I'm not coming in alone. I'm not coming in a lone ranger. The fact is, the country overwhelmingly is starting to send younger members of Congress uh, to go legislate, sending more people of color to go legislate, to go fight for the needs of the future and our, the needs of our kids. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be able to work alongside this class. This uh, congressional system is notorious for working on this seniority system where people say it might take you decades to get anything done. But that has changed. The majority of people in the Democratic caucus in Congress were elected in 2018 up until today. And so that is shifting. We can finally get to a place, I think, where new ideas are taken up quickly and we can tackle things like our failing electric grid. We can bring transit dollars and build Project Connect here in Austin, that we can address the affordable housing crisis. Those are the issues that I think a lot of the new members of Congress are coming to and bringing to the table and we're finding open ears. You had some pretty big names from the Progressive Caucus coming out and supporting you when you were running. Uh, Representative Alexa Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Senator Bernie Sanders. Are you assuming that those folks who supported you during your election will be allies in Congress? They've been great allies. I mean, we had Senator Sanders here uh, campaigning this November, went and did a trip throughout Hayes County, uh, rallying people there. Also in Austin, I was with uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez in San Antonio. They've just been uh, incredibly committed because when we saw, for example, Senator Ted Cruz get on a plane and go to the beach during the winter storm, Representative Ocasio-Cortez came and flew to Texas and worked on food bank lines and raised money uh, for local charities. And so I'm proud of their support. But then I also have longstanding relationships with the members of Congress here from Texas. We have Congressman Lloyd Doggett, uh, who I share Travis County with, who's been a long-term ally of mine since I first ran for the city council. Uh, Congressman Joaquin Castro down in San Antonio, who's been a mentor to me since I was 24 years old. Mm -hmm. And so while we have those big name progressives who I'm so excited to work with, there's also Texans here who've been working with me and who I've been, uh, been mentored by really for years that I'm excited to work with. Any Republicans you're reaching out to? I mean, you said that you'd be willing to compromise on some things if that's what it takes to get your priorities done. Yeah, you know, I recently um, uh, received a, a note from Senator Cornyn uh, at, right after the election, I saw what he did on music venues, for example, that's really important for this city. And so places where any Republican is willing to partner on protecting small businesses or keeping um, our dreamers from being separated from their families or protecting our veterans, I'd be ready to work on those, on those issues. Do you think, you know, uh, sometimes the progressive wing of the Democratic Party in Congress has gotten criticized for, you know, not wanting to compromise on certain things. And then, you know, that's why we didn't have a codification of Roe versus Wade or whatnot. Do you think that being able to work with Republicans is going to be critical in your first term since they do have the majority right now? Yeah, I mean, if Republicans want to codify Roe versus Wade, I'd be ready to sign on to that bill. Sign me up. And I don't care whether it's a Republican's name on the top of the bill, independents or Democrats, if it's going to codify Roe versus Wade, I'm ready to do that work. And I think the Progressive Caucus would unanimously sign on to that. So I'd be ready to compromise where we need to do compromise. The question is whether folks on the Republican side of the table would be actually willing to come to the table and negotiate, because I'm willing to negotiate on the budget. I want a 15 or 16 or $17 an hour minimum wage. If they want to come up from 725, we could meet somewhere if they're willing to come to the table. Where I'm not willing to negotiate is on taking people's civil rights away, on taking people's voting rights away, on cutting social security, which is already so such a small check for people. And that's, I think, what uh, distinguishes us as progressives is we're will we want to make progress. And I'm willing to negotiate and compromise to make progress. What I'm not willing to do is go backward.
Mm, some of those policies like the Green New Deal immigration reform and really even reimagining police reform, which, of course, you were a, a leader in that conversation when you were in Austin City Council. The GOP has taken those policies and attacked progressives here in Texas for those ideas. Do you think that those ideas are out of reach for Texas as a state? I don't think so at all, because the fact of the matter is Austin Energy used to be a, a utility that got most of our energy from dirty fuel. Now, a majority of the energy that Austin Energy produces is renewable. So we've gotten there. We can endure all the, ta the attacks and all the attack ads, but what's important is to actually get to work. And that's what I'm gonna be committed to doing. There's going to be attacks, there's going to be false ads, you're gonna see all sorts of stuff on TV. Uh, but what my commitment is, is to keep helping the folks at the grocery store, keep helping my neighbors in East Austin, keep supporting folks in Hayes County. And so, Whatever ends up happening on TV or on CNN is one thing. What I care about is what's actually happening in the community. And it is the community and those constituents who got you to where you are now. What are you hearing from your voters and constituents now that you're actually elected as for the immediate work they want to see you getting to when you get to Congress? It's really important for us to be able to provide casework. So I'm going to be opening up two district offices, one closer to the northern end, one closer to the southern end of this district because if somebody's having trouble, and I've already heard from people getting through to the VA and getting their benefits after serving this country, then I wanna be their first phone call. Somebody who cuts through the red tape makes sure that they can get the benefits that they've earned or their social security check or if they're having trouble with Medicare. That casework, I think, is just so absolutely important. And so we're gonna be there advocating uh, for the constituents. And then we're gonna be advocating for the constituents on these bigger issues. Uh, because people are worried about what's going to happen in the next winter storm. Things haven't been fixed here. The federal government should step in and provide that level of oversight. People are worried about paying the rent. We need to be able to pass federal policy to finally invest in things um, like affordable housing to lower the rent and in making public uh, education, public colleges, public trade schools tuition free so that people can move up in their jobs and earn a better wage. All right, Congressman-elect Greg Kassar, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you all so much for having me.